Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. And I remember recently being at a scientific meeting where they're describing the methods and they say using standard optogenetic techniques which again is an amazing sentence if you go back just a few years. We now using optogenetics we know the precise patterns of activity that uh, can cause or or turn off these uh, sensations, cognitions and actions and we can see how they can go uh, awry in disease models and so everything from anxiety to depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, the circuits involved in schizophrenia and circuits involved in, in autism. All of these have now been studied with this millisecond precision of light and the cellular resolution that optogenetics uh, provides. That's today on Healthy Minds. This program is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Bank of America Charitable Gift Fund, and the John and Polly Sparks Foundation. It sounds like science fiction, but it's actually science. Today, I speak with Dr. Carl Dyseroff about a number of new technologies that are creating tremendous advances in our understanding of the brain and potentially treatment of psychiatric conditions. Carl, thank you for joining us today. 3,000 miles apart, but it's the next best thing to being there. Great to see you. Yeah, we're getting used to that. I wish I could be there, but uh, hopefully soon. Absolutely. So I want to jump in and talk about your book, uh, Projections, A Story of Human Emotions. And I want to ask you, what was it like for you to write a book where you really brought together your clinical experience, your, your research, endeavors, and also personal perspectives. What was it like for you to write the book? <laughs> well, I had uh, always wanted to be a writer. That was my, my first and greatest passion. So it was uh, <laughs> almost uh, therapeutic, if you will, coming full circle on, uh, on the course of a big part of my life. I'd always loved words. I loved playing with words and, and thinking about how they made me feel and made others feel. But then I got interested in science and medicine, and, and that that you know the the, the years uh, of of all those wonderful uh, discoveries, the scientific work, uh, sort of caught me up. Uh, but then uh, coming back to it, coming back to the writing was a, an incredible experience because I remembered how much I, I loved it, and it became a. <laughs> almost uh, addictive. Each day I would look forward to it. I'd think about the right words to use in the book. And, and then the whole time thinking about how I could communicate with the public to, to share the excitement of what was going on in science, but also share these very hard uh, uh, experiences, the internal worlds of, of patients with psychiatric illness, uh, making that something that, that was communicable to the public in a, in a helpful way. So it was, a, it was quite a journey, and uh, in the end, it was, it was really thrilling. The, um, one of the areas of the science that you speak about is optogenetics. So in many ways, optogenetics sounds like science fiction, uh, but it now is real science. Tell us about optogenetics. Optogenetics is one of the sparks that made this moment in, in time uh, uh, happen, which was this conjunction of our understanding of our inner worlds at, uh, with the external progress in, in neuroscience. And what optogenetics is, it's a way of using light to probe the inner workings of the brain, but with a twist. It's not the way you normally think about using light. We think about light as a way of bringing in information bring in uh, concepts, ideas, thoughts, images into our brains. Optogenetics does the opposite. It uses light as a tool to control things, to make things happen. And this is different. It's extremely uh, uh, powerful, and I'll, I'll explain why. Inside the brain, we have a, a real uh, a beautiful complexity of interconnected cells, uh, almost 100 billion neurons in the, in the human brain, each of them making 10,000 or more synapses with other, other cells, uh, connections with other neurons. 
and they're all intertwined and the cells that do things that are completely different are right next to each other and they're all electrical in nature so if you put in an electrode and you stimulate one spot of the brain you're going to stimulate all the cells that may have totally different jobs doing completely different things even opposing each other and that makes it very hard to understand in the brain as you know what's actually making things happen what are sensations cognitions and actions how are they elicited how can they go wrong very hard to understand what actually uh, matters what makes things happen with optogenetics we use a, a trick uh, we make some cells respond to light now normally none of the cells respond to light deep in the brain there's no light in there anyway but that's a great situation if one wanted to confer light sensitivity onto some cells but not others because then you have a way of achieving specificity of control. If you could turn some cells on with light or turn some cells off with light, that would be incredibly powerful. Of course, how do you do that is the, is the question. Uh, and it turned out the way to do it that was practical was, seems almost, uh, as you say, science, science fiction-like, is to go to microbes, single-celled algae, uh, archaebacteria, ancient forms of life, and take genes, little bits of DNA that encode biomolecules, very special biomolecules called microbial opsins. These turn, transduce, as we say, light into electricity. These little proteins receive a photon of light and allow ions, charged particles, to pass across the membrane of a cell. That's electricity, bioelectricity, if you will. And that singular job, this turning of a photon into the passage of ions, allows us to use light to turn neurons on or off. And that's the essence of optogenetics. Seems unlikely to work, uh, but turns out it does. And uh, first experiment now, you know, 2004 was the first experiment in July, and, and now it's been you know, more than 17 years, and uh, thousands of laboratories around the world are using it for discoveries. What led you to come up with that idea? How did, how did you realize to put these things together? Well, a lot of people were trying. This was the kind of thing that, uh, you know, science is an exciting uh, and unpredictable uh, uh, journey. Uh, and the irony is that the microbial opsins were very well known. They were understood for a long time uh, to exist. Uh, they'd been discovered in 1971 uh, by a couple of scientists at the University of California, San Francisco, Dieter Osterhelt and Walter Stachinius. And at the same time, you had a thread of neuroscientists, including Francis Crick of DNA uh, structure fame, had been saying in neuroscience, we need ways to turn cells on or off selectively. And Crick, in 1999, he even suggested that light would be a good way to do it, but he had absolutely no idea how to do this. He, he wrote in a, a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1999 that light would be a great way to do it, but this seems far-fetched, he said. Um, the irony is, this was 1999 that he wrote that. We would do that first experiment uh, five years later in 2004, but the microbial opsins had been known since 1971. It was just seemed so unlikely to work that you would be able to take these genes from these uh, uh, microbes all the way across the tree of life, put them into sensitive, delicate, intricate cells in the, in the mammalian brain and have them work robustly, efficiently, well, have them be a versatile and generalizable strategy. So uh, the first experiment showed it was that it might work. It was just in a dish. And then it took us about five years of, of hard work, engineering, uh, figuring out how to put all the pieces together. Along the way, we, we worked hard to understand these proteins a lot uh, more deeply. And that helped us engineer them, turn them into new forms that made them more potent, more effective. We used crystallography, the same sort of tool that Crick used to unlock the double helix structure of DNA to unlock the structure of these proteins, these uh, channel rhodopsins, a very potent form of these. And we were able to see how they work, how they allow charged particles to flow across the membrane. And that let us change them into new and powerful configurations. And so it was a lot of beautiful basic science, understanding the proteins themselves. And at the end of the day, we achieved what Crick had, had asked for, which is we could turn on or off individual kinds of cells or even single cells within freely uh, behaving complex mammals. And you could turn them on or off instantaneously by turning on or off the light and see the reaction exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, for, for, the, for the laboratory animal. And you mentioned that it's used by thousands of labs. Um, and I remember recently being at a scientific meeting where they're describing the methods 
and they say using standard optogenetic techniques, which again is an amazing sentence if you go back just a few years. That's right. Tell, tell us about some of the types of discoveries that are being made using optogenetics. Yeah, this is uh, one of the most gratifying things has been helping other people use the, the, the techniques. And uh, we've had, we've sent the, the DNA, uh, the clones as we call them, to all over thousands of laboratories around the world and, and many thousands of papers have been published. But we've also done work uh, in our own lab uh, using, using these, these methods. You know, everything you can imagine has, has now been uh, studied. Uh, primary survival drives, the, the motivations that are so powerful in animals and that, that can go wrong in psychiatric disease, uh, uh, aggression, uh, parenting, hunger, thirst, social interaction, motivation to overcome uh, challenge, uh, all these basic uh, uh, functions of survival for the, for the animal brain. We now, using optogenetics, we know the precise patterns of activity that uh, can cause or, or turn off these uh, sensations, cognitions, and actions, and we can see how they can go uh, awry in disease models. And so everything from anxiety to depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, the circuits involved in schizophrenia, and circuits involved in, in autism, all of these have now been studied with this millisecond precision of light and the cellular resolution that optogenetics uh, provides. It's a little quite remarkable, but also a little disturbing to have uh, a freely moving mammal, our cousins across the tree of life, like a, a mouse or a rat, and to see as you play in a precise pattern of activity to precisely defined cells, to see a complex behavior instantly put in place or specifically suppressed. A hungry animal no longer caring about food or a not hungry animal becoming uh, ravenous, uh, same thing with thirst, same thing with aggression, uh, violent behavior, uh, or very simple things, simple actions like turning left or turning right. Finally, with neuroscience, with studying the brain, we have this uh, material causal understanding of which connections, which cells uh, can cause or suppress these, these complex action patterns. But it's a little eerie too, uh, and it raises a very interesting you know, philosophical and even, uh, you know, consideration of, of ethical issues. It is extraordinary to, to think about the fact that in our complicated brains and our complicated behaviors, turning on or off a few cells um, through their connections could have such an effect on behaviors and, and, and thoughts. That's right. And this is, you know, as you well know, there have been uh, very uh, vigorous debates over the nature of the causes for actions, uh, there are you know, vigorous uh, uh, and contentious arguments over genes versus culture, for example, in, in the causes of violence, uh, very uh, powerful debates on the, the, the nature of, of free will and personal responsibility. And in many ways, a lot of, the, although optogenetics doesn't answer the fundamental philosophical questions, those of course are, are things that we as, a, as a, a human family still have to struggle with. What is very clear is that adding or removing a few blips of electrical activity in a few very well-defined cells can and does instantaneously change the actions chosen by an animal, it reshapes their priorities, reshapes the choices that are made in the moment. And that can no longer be denied. We know this with, with incredible precision. Um, and so it's, it's an important um, state for us to be in. We know exactly how many cells can be involved and, and how many blips of activity in those cells. In many ways, it, it sort of shows that the nature-nurture question really both are important. The, the actual physical cells genetically there and, and also environment that has an impact uh, on those cells. Certainly true, uh, and, and and the fact that there is a structural and a cellular basis to them doesn't point the uh, the arrow of causality or blame, uh, however you like to look at it, on either nature or nurture. Uh, the cells and their connections are created by uh, genes and developments, but also are reshaped by experience and, and plasticity. So uh, both are important. Uh, but now, materially, at the elemental level of cells and their connections, we can understand causality. We often think of science as informing clinical care, but you make the point that, in, in many ways, your work as a clinician has helped inform your thoughts about the science, and I'd like you to speak a little bit about that. 
So I'm a, a psychiatrist. As you know, you, you and I share a lot of the same motivations. We, we are uh, deep down trying to understand uh, mental illness and try to uh, work on ways to alleviate this, this uh, vast source of, of human suffering. And I, I am a general adult psychiatrist. I, I still treat patients both in the clinic and uh, uh, with uh, inpatient work. I have, uh, despite everything going on, it's something I keep returning to. It, it matters so much to me. It's something that, um, admittedly, uh, when I've spent a, a little time away, a, a few months away, and I come back to the inpatient work, it can be a little uh, uh, nerve-wracking because I, I haven't been there for a few months, but then it's immediately, it recharges me with, with motivation, with, with energy. I, I remember, you know, what, what brought me here, and I remember the, the, the need, the human need that's, that's there. It's, it's so uh, enthralling and disturbing, uh, and uh, it's, it's both sad and, uh, and frustrating, but also very interesting. Psychiatric disease has so many of these, these qualities all, all mixed in together. And th this is something that's, that's guided me uh, over, over, over decades, is how can we come to a, a deeper understanding of these states? And, and uh, understanding comes first. Optogenetics is a wonderful tool for understanding, and that's this nice synergy. I can, I can work uh, in the laboratory, and then I can talk to a human being the next day who's suffering from crippling anxiety, and I can talk about the concrete, physical, material elements that we now know cause each of the fundamental elements of anxiety because we've, we've shown this in the, in the laboratory, a connection from point A to point B causing the respiratory rate changes of anxiety. Another connection causing the negative internal subjective state. Another connection causing the behavioral avoidance of anxiety, uh, avoiding risky environments. And this is incredibly helpful for the patients. They, they have this inner state that's been crushing, been debilitating, that nobody understands. It's hard to explain. And I can tell them materially, I now know at, these, at this fundamental level, and I can share, and we're talking about it as scientists, we now know that this is very physical, very real, precisely definable, rigorously uh, studyable. And this is incredibly helpful for the, for the patients and, and for their families. And, and this is what I hope, you know, understanding is, is so much of it in, in psychiatry, just as in, in, in years past, you know, it was for cancer and, and, and for other uh, realms of, of, of the, the human condition that were poorly understood, stigmatized. Uh, now, it's very clear that with, with psychiatry, the convergence of, of the science and the, and the medicine together is, is, brings a lot of hope for the future. And the patients feel it, and that, that uh, matters a great deal to me. Yeah, it, I think that, you know, with the example of anxiety that you give, explaining that, first of all, no one decides they want to be anxious. This is, that just says nobody decides they want to have cancer. It, it is something that physically um, is occurring and understanding that it gives people in some ways more control over their anxiety or other symptoms that they may have. That's right. Yeah. And this is, the patients tell me this and, and it's not that we're, you know, our job is, is by no means done, but we've cracked open the door. And this is a theme in the in the book that I return to uh, with each each story. The, the projections has a is a collection of stories about human experiences in these altered states. And and I I I, I the, the, there's a, the the central focus on the human beings, but I, I I try to show the 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 promise and the power of the science and how it brings hope uh, for the future. One of the things um, that you speak about in the book that I found very striking and it's an example of how the clinical informs the science, is in your interactions with a person who has autism and experiences what many people with autism experience, which is difficulty making eye contact, and speaking with that person and getting a sense of what, why he does that, what's the reason for that. And I'd like you to speak a little bit about what you learned speaking to the person and then how that relates to some of the neuroscience. Yeah. Well, this was a, you know, this for the, <laughs> for someone who uh, has worked hard to develop both the the science, the scientific side and the medical side um, of his life. This 
this patient, this conversation with the patient was a really uh, important moment of convergence of the different uh, sides of life. Uh, this was a patient um, uh, who had autism but was uh, verbal, so able to communicate, was able to, to tell me uh, and, and discuss to some extent the, the symptoms and the inner experiences, which was which is not true of everybody with autism, as you know. And uh, so this patient was, was interestingly positioned on the spectrum, you know, severe enough to be debilitated, but verbal enough to, to communicate accurately, which was an, you know, an incredible opportunity. My patient, someone who I was helping, many people, you know, although we don't have medicines for, for autism, we can help the comorbid symptoms, including anxiety that, that these uh, uh, people experience. And, so as, as the psychiatrist, I was helping to treat the anxiety. This was a, a, a young man who had very severe anxiety, uh, particularly in, in social and work situations. Social interactions are, are very anxiety provoking if you fundamentally have trouble understanding and keeping up with uh, all the dynamics. And this patient also had uh, other symptoms of autism, including a very profound uh, eye contact avoidance. This is a um, common feature in autism. Uh, it's very striking to see. Uh, there's not just a uh, incidental looking somewhere else, but also a quite a market avoidance when eye contact is made, a, a immediate uh, uh, flickering away of the eyes as well, as if it's uh, aversive in some way. And so I was able, this was a patient I was able to talk to about this. And, and you know, for all the time taken in the course of going through, you know, MD, PhD, residency training, postdoctoral work, this is, you know, sort of a double, <laughs> double duty of, of training and all that. And, and sometimes you don't always get the feedback that, this was a good course to take. This was valuable, but in this moment, it was it was quite a remarkable thing. Uh, I was able to talk to this human being and ask, at this moment when you make this eye contact and and look away immediately, what's really going on? What are you afraid? I was able to ask the patient, and he said, "No, not afraid." So this was a patient who had every reason to be afraid. Very powerful anxiety, which I was treating, but it wasn't. Fear. It wasn't anxiety, but I was able to probe uh, deeper, just communicating with this this human being who was my patient. And he said, uh, after uh, some back and forth, what we were able to to establish was that it was a sense of being overwhelmed, not fear, but but too much, too much information coming through the eye channel of communication, and that the, the vastness and the speed of all that information was too much, he knew it was too much, felt it to be too much, and that was the aversive uh, fundamental quality of the eye contact, the being overwhelmed with information. Okay, so this, you know, this, not many patients would be positioned well enough on the spectrum to have such a precise discussion about this. And the amazing thing was that this was, you know, over the some years of work with, with optogenetics, uh, this was a concept that we were able to map quite well onto precise and causal neural circuit processes with the overexcitability, easily triggered nature of cells in certain parts of the brain actually which is a feature of autism, as a number of, of uh, clinical studies, including EEG, can suggest, this overexcitability indeed can limit the information carrying capacity of cells in frontal cortex, for example. And this is something that we could measure precisely in bits per second, that the overexcitability that causes social dysfunction also places limits on the information carrying capacity in cells in this uh, uh, frontal cortex uh, part of the brain. And so bringing these disparate concepts together, the, a human being's internal experience, just articulable enough with precise and causal information processing established in homologous circuits in, in, in uh, mammals. This convergence was an example and became the focus of one of these, these uh, human stories and in, in, in projections. It's one example. Uh, there are others. There's eating disorders. There's mania. There's depression. There's grief and bereavement. 
uh, dementia, uh, and uh, this is this is a I think a for the world, for the community, for the public uh, to share. Join us again next time when we continue this wonderful conversation with Dr. Dysaroff. Remember, with help, there is hope. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. This program is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Bank of America Charitable Gift Fund, and the John and Polly Sparks Foundation. Remember, with help, there is hope.